Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm delighted to say Mark's made it tonight, as you can see. The bike's there. You think we could have got my taxi? Anyway, uh, this is the first, uh, sorry, the fifth in the series of the Chancellor's Talks. Uh, my name's David Eustace, and I'm the current Chancellor of Edinburgh Napier University. And typically the role of the Chancellor is like Dumbledore. Twice a year you turn up and you give out degrees. But in taking on the role, I wanted to do a little bit more. Uh, and it was based on a hope to try and bring people who inspire other people to the forefront of many who otherwise may not get the chance to experience uh, inspiring characters or people with a story to tell. Uh, as I say, this is the fifth in the series. Uh, and for me, it was a dream. When it started out, it was something, thankfully, uh, Professor Nolan, the principal and the university team have backed 100%. And one of the things I wanted to take away from the events uh, was the idea this isn't just about Edinburgh Napier University, this is a bigger picture that we could invite anybody to come and join us. And we would like people to come and join us. I love the idea of an 18 year old sitting next to an 88 year old. So whilst we're hosting it, this is about something that we would like to welcome all to come and join us. So, growing up, university to me was a world I couldn't have imagined. So to be standing here in the role of Chancellor is testament that dreams do exist and things can happen with a bit of endurance. Uh, we launched the Chancellor's Talk series in 2016 with a chap called Milton Glazer whose name won't be really known to many in this room, but in 1977, New York City was on its knees. The city was bankrupt, and they turned to Milton to save the city. And Milton came up with the logo, I Heart NY. Probably the most recognizable marketing logo in the world. And we were fortunate that Milton agreed to launch the series. The second person was a chap called Jeremy Thomas who is the UK's most successful independent film producer. Jeremy, at 38, won an Oscar for producing Bertolucci's movie, The Last Emperor. He worked on four other Bertolucci movies and eight David Cronenberg films, including Crash, uh, Naked Lunch. He also worked on Rabbit Proof Fence, Sexy Beast, Young Adam, and the first film he ever made was The Great Rock and Roll Swindle. The third person was an incredible lady called Anne Daniels, who was a British polar explorer and the first part of the first female duo to do both the North and the South Pole. Now, the thing that inspired me so much about Anne was Anne, prior to applying for the role that she saw an advert in the newspaper to be part of a polar expedition, had never climbed a hill in her life. Now, to listen and talk to these people, which, is, which I find uplifting. Uh, the fourth person that came along it uh, was the Right Honourable James Wolfe QC. And James is just, James's world is just another world to me. You know, it's just, it's out there. He's talking about something I really don't understand, but I was glad I was in front of him here and not in his playground. Uh, but when it comes to Scottish law, James is a man. But these are the characters, and it's this diversity that we want to bring to the general public. The, the talks are really quite informal. Uh, but hopefully you, you may take something away tonight, just a little thing that just makes you think, you know what, I can do this or I can at least try. Uh, so there's a couple of points before I introduce our fifth guest tonight that uh, there is no fire alarms scheduled for this evening. So if you hear it going ring-a-ding-ding, -ding, please leave in an orderly man manner. I'll be on Mark's bike and out the side door. Uh, the second thing is it's always with good intent but people forget to switch their phones off, so can you please put your phones off? Uh, I think that's only growing up stuff. Uh, yep, okay, so Mark. Uh, the fifth guest in the series tonight is incredible Mark Bowman. And what serves testament to Mark's attraction, appeal, I don't know what to call it, is we had to change theatres tonight to fit so many people, and that says a lot about Mark. Uh, Mark's going to tell you his adventures. It started from university when he decided to cycle around the world. 
This is a guy who rode, or attempted to row, from Morocco to Barbados, I believe. Uh, ended up treading water for 17 hours. But most of you will know Mark for the incredible record of going around the world on a bike in 80 days. That, to me, is just mind-blowing. Now, I'm not going to go too much into this. It's not the only world record Mark has set. He set another world record from Cairo to Cape Town uh, and numerous others which have been documentaries in the BBC. He is a sportsman extraordinaire, an endurance athlete, a broadcaster, and does so much work for charity. Mark has closed so much into a small space of time I think the best thing I can do now is pass you over to Mark. Can you please welcome Mark Bowman? Good evening, all. And um, David, thanks for the warm welcome. Uh, thanks for the welcome from those who are actually from Napier, back to Napier. Um, I guess when, when David got in touch and asked if I could uh, come along this evening, um, I said yes for, t for two reasons. Um, first of all, I've got close connection with, with this great university because uh, I was first asked to come in to help open the, the Site Hill campus uh, in 2011. Kept in touch with a lot of the team there and um, Dr. Leslie Ingram, who was, who's in the audience and we're gonna have up on stage in a short while was uh, at the heart of my performance team for the, for the 80 days. So we can have a good blether about the sports science and uh, some of the tech because you've got me, what was a wild man adventure as a teenager, you know, of somebody who spent over a year of my life living in a tent to in the last couple of years really trying to push the envelope in terms of what's possible in terms of endurance sport. And that takes a lot of science. That takes a lot of thought and planning. So I need good people like, like Leslie. And my second reason to, to come back and say yes to David's invitation was because I'm the rector at the University of Dundee. And like David, I'm very keen to, to generate closer ties between um, higher education institutions in Scotland. The role of rector is equally sort of undefined. You can make of it what you wish. And, um, you know, whilst I could simply stand there and, and, and help with graduations, you know, I've got a great passion to, to, to help the students in Dundee where I was a... Uh, uh, a high school student to create better links within the, the community they live. It's a great place to go and study, but to actually understand the opportunities that come afterwards. And the, my real hobby horse when it comes to high school and higher education is always about how do you partner a great education with the quiet confidence to make real choices around what you do next? Because you tend to find that people are who are happy in life, you know, to find that you know, in terms of however you wish, in terms of success. But people who, are, who truly have, have that sense of fire in their belly and they're in the driving seat have, have partnered the skill set they've got with, all, with the quiet confidence to take it in, in the direction of their choosing. So I don't care whether you work for the world's largest corporation or plow your own furrow, as long as it's what you've chosen to do. You tend to find people who, who, who have less contentment and happiness can be brilliantly bright, but they don't feel in control. Uh, so, so those were the reasons I said yes. And it's great that so many of you said yes as well. We've got a, we've got a, a full audience tonight. Um, if you're sitting there with absolutely no idea of who I am and why you are here, I, 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 thought, I thought I would start with a one-minute film. Uh, it puts into context what I and my team pulled off last year. And whilst I get the credit for, for what this was, um, you know, I'll, I'll always say we. Because last year there was the best part of 40 people working on this project. There's a hell of a lot more than what you see if you're just following on social media, a dot on the map and the social media updates. So this is a minute of what will be the documentary which you can, which you can catch soon. I'm gonna cycle around the world in 80 days from Paris around the planet, 18,000 miles. I've been building towards this since I was a 12 year old boy. You know, it's just about ultra endurance. It's just about physically and mentally, can you do this? The alarm goes off at half three in the morning, you're on the bike at four to actually get through it. Don't try and fight it, just sit steady on the bike and do the hours. You just need to commit to not stopping. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on Mark. And I was really, really struggling. I really hit rock bottom. I'm feeling it, 13, 14, 15 hours into a day. 
he definitely is pushing himself beyond whatever he's pushed before. It hurts. It really hurts. I'm never convinced that that sells it particularly well. Um, I was fed up with people saying to me, I'd love to do what you do. And I kept saying to them, I think you like the idea of what I do. Um, because what I do ultimately as a broadcaster is pure escapism. You know, it's, 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 I've been to 130 countries in the last 10 years, filming a lot for the BBC and others. And, you know, I'm that kid that never grew up. Everything I've done has always been in a hurry. It's about, been about firsts and fastest and trying to do stuff that's not been done before. And I guess when you do watch that in, in clips, you know, you can, you can escape to that reality in that moment. But what I'm always very keen to share is every project I've ever built is like a startup. My entire career has lived in sort of year and a half, two, two and a half year cycles of what's the idea, what is the art of the possible, how are we going to fund this, how are we going to recruit the team, how are you going to give yourself even the chance to get to the start line, and then what's possible. Reading off script, absolutely doing what you set out to do. And what people get to see is the sum total of that, the, sh the, the simple sport of it. And when people come to me all the time with their grand ideas to take on big expeditions, I never doubt their core competence to do the job. What I do often question is how realistic they are about what else it takes to even give yourself a chance to do these things. So being able to communicate and understand why other people would care, to get people to buy into these projects, and it doesn't matter how successful you are and whether you've got a profile and a track record, to still get the opportunities to do the simple job that, that, that you think is possible. And at the heart of all my projects over the last 12 years professionally has been this want, this wish to do things on my terms. Now that sounds very simple and very obvious, but, but, but I really want to talk about that because if I was just simply to talk in the next half hour or so about saddle sores and gear choices, then you know, some of you might care. But I think we can all relate to, I think we can all relate to what, it, what it takes to actually go from an acorn of an idea to the big projects. Let's bust some of the myths and legends around what success actually feels like when you're doing it, not what it, what it looks like from others when you're, when you're talking about what's been. So perspective is a very dangerous thing. And if you look back on last year's project, it looks professional, it looks sure-footed, it looks inevitable. And trust me, it didn't feel any of those things at the time. And uh, so I want to, I want to, I want to tell you, take you behind the scenes, and, and and even if you do know what we did last year, explain what it what it gave for my team to have the confidence and the plan to do it. So um, to to take you back briefly, I'm not going to talk about many of the expeditions in a lot of detail, but it's worth giving some some stepping stones because that thing I was saying about inevitability, you could reverse engineer the last 23 years of my life, and it looks quite logical. One thing has led to the next. But obviously, I couldn't, you know, that would be a lie to, to, to do just that. Because after each project, yes, I did have clear horizons as to the next. But only because I'd done that, I'd learned something, I'd extended my comfort zone, and I could see where that then led to. So you look back on those things, and it looks, you know, fairly, fairly chronological. But at the time, well, let me tell you, I was 11 years old when I read in the, in the Courier, in the Dundee Courier, about a guy who had cycled end to end. You know, it's the big t box to ticks if you're a cyclist in the UK and you're interested in doing endurance miles. A thousand miles from top to toe. Tens of thousands of people do it every year. But it was a new concept to me. I was 11 years old. And naive, of course I was. I, w I'd, I was homeschooled. I'd never, I'd, I'd not been off the farm much. It was myself and my two sisters. So I didn't have many social reference points. You know, there was nobody telling me I couldn't or shouldn't do these things. And I remember getting the, 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 the old AA roadmap out of the, the farm car, the Landy, and getting a highlighter pen and finding the roads from the top of Scotland to the bottom of England. And I took it to mum and dad and I said, I want to do this. And uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think my dad was a bit grumpy about a highlighter pen all over the map. Um, <laughs> but I think but what my mum said was, why don't you try something smaller first? Because you've not really cycled off the farm before. Um, so, so, so I, recruited a, I recruited a buddy and we, we went from Discovery Point Dundee to Oban, three days. But it wasn't just the sport of it, the cycle and the journey. It was the planning of it, going door to door, raising sponsorship, literally shaking a can, raising sponsorship for a few Scottish charities. And then afterwards, 
sharing my story for the first time, getting my picture in the paper. Every part of that became sort of my thing, and it was very different from what my friends were doing, and it sort of, that was important. It's important for any child to have those things which define them. And I then got plonked into high school, and it was a hell of a shock, because I was socially inept, and, um, you know, I just was this country bumpkin who had spent the first decade of my life riding horses and skiing and cycling bikes, and I've got two daughters now, and I do worry that they they will not grow up knowing how to make you know, their own shoes out of rabbit skins and things which I was very good at. Um, so to fast forward dec a decade from that, I'd done a, a lot of amateur expeditions. I'd soloed John O'Groot's Land's End when I was 15. By the time I left university in Glasgow, I had a perfectly useful economics and politics degree. And I thought, right, let's cycle around the world. Now, it wasn't meant to be the start of a career. This wasn't, this, wasn't, this wasn't some sure-footed attempt so that 13 years later I could, oh well, 12, 13 years later I could go around the world in 80 days. That was beyond my imagination. I mean, that would be utterly nuts. I simply had that, I could see the next rung in the ladder, the next ambition. And so it wasn't meant to be a career. The aforementioned father still doesn't think it is. And... Um, <laughs> And, and, and at, the, at that point, I simply thought, well, what have I got to lose? I'm in student debt. What's a bit more debt? Let's cycle around the world. And, and I'd, I had no ambition to be on telly, mainly because we didn't have a telly growing up. It wasn't part of my language or reference point. I simply walked into BBC Scotland because I thought, as an e economics graduate, this is the only way to give return on investment to the sponsors. So I spent a very dangerous year telling everyone who cared to listen that you know their sponsorship would be would be thanked for by a TV documentary. And I spent the same year trying to chat up the BBC and others and saying this whole thing was funded, they just needed to give me the cameras. And I, I walked into BBC Scotland, which used to be in Queen Margaret Drive in Glasgow, during lunch hour while people had their lunch. And um, people ask me all the time now how you get into television. And I have no idea because all TV studios now have security gates. So you can't just walk in during lunch hour and chat to people as they have their sandwiches. Um, so those were the humble beginnings, and this was a younger, hairier me pedaling around the world the first time. So this was something that some of you might have seen. It was a big BBC One documentary series called The Man Who Cycled the World. And um, my ambition back then was quite simple. I assumed, because I'd never raced, I'd never been coached, there was nothing professional about what I'd done, I'd just gone on lots of amateur expeditions, um, was just to, to cycle around the world. And I thought, well, I'll go to the people who have broken the record and raced it because they'll have the best routes, best research, you know, simply learn from the best. Not because I can in any way compete with them. I assumed that this would be like the round the world sailing record. I thought it would be the biggest prize in the sport. And so I couldn't believe, now we're going back 10, 11 years now, I couldn't believe that the record at that point stood at 276 days. And the last three people had come home within a matter of a week of each other. So I looked at that and I thought, what don't I know? You know, okay, I'd only pedaled across Europe and bits of Scandinavia. My biggest ride had been about a 3,000-miler. And this was an 18,000-mile route around the world. And there was me simply trying to research a post-university pedal around the planet. And uh, I suddenly realized, hang on a second, there's a record up for grabs here. And not just could we try and pip a record like people seem to be doing, but you could, it was more of a feat of enterprise than bike riding. You could really define this for the first time. I mean, you never want to be unkind <laughs> on anyone who's pedaled 18,000 miles. But, but 276 days is very, very slow. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so, I mean, you, you know, young, naive me, age 22, I thought, right, well, what's possible? 18,000 miles, I can ride a century a day. Many of us could ride 100 miles if we had to. You know, over, over the world, that would be 180 days. Let's allow a day, a fortnight for contingency, including flights and whatnot. That gives you 195 days to get around the planet. That was my target. I went out to the press and the public and I said, I want to be the first person to go sub 200. Always, always give yourself a margin of error. Um, so, so that was my plan, very plain and simple. And people said I was nuts. Why do you think you can break a world record by two months? So the first route, which I won't go into in detail, Started and finished in Paris, went through a southern tier of Asia, through Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, India. Can you imagine just leaving university and you're suddenly sleeping in mosques every night through Iran, under armed escort, skirting the Baluchi Helmand province border, you know, 3,000 miles into a cracking headwind across Australia. There was a single day in the US when Louisiana, deep south, where I was hit by a car and then mugged that evening. Lots of stuff happened. 
Um, the only silver lining from that awful day was it happened about two and a half weeks from the finish. And um, well, if you get hit by a car and then mugged, um, it took it from being a local story being told by, by the, the Edinburgh papers, because I was living in Edinburgh at the time and, and, and the Courier, um, to front page national press. And for the final two and a half weeks, you know, it became a much, much, much bigger story than it otherwise would have been. So never go looking for, <laughs> a, you know, a car crash and a mugging, but it was a pretty, pretty incredible PR stunt. Um, so I came home in 194 days and 17 hours. So, uh, you know, the perspective was smashing the record by months, but I had to be quite honest about that and say, well, I came home within eight hours of what I said I would. And The Man Who Cycled the World, that documentary, took me from, before that, pulling pints in the local pub to suddenly coming home and being offered, offered you know, book deals, talk tours, documentaries, and, a, and suddenly I realized I'm not going to be an accountant. Um, so that was something I couldn't have imagined. And I'm certainly not saying it's been, it's been easy since when you create a career and build teams like this. But it gave me the confidence that building these projects and the interesting part is people very quickly took that record and bettered it and assumed that by the simple feat of cycling around the world faster would give them the legacy, give them the business, give them the opportunities to create more impact for themselves and others and those around them. But the simple sport of it, being good at what you do, unfortunately in this day and age is not enough. Creating impact, doing more, is about creating a story around what you do, sharing what you do, understanding why other people would care about what you do, and you find it in business, in charities, with athletes, with everything. It's that understanding of how you build a community around what you do. And if you were to look back on each year and have an impact report in terms of who you are and your teams are, it has to be more than just, am I paying the mortgage? Have I got food on the table? Am I doing as an individual something which grows year on year? It has to be. And, and, and ultimately, if you're simply good at what you do, you you're unfortunately replaceable because that is, you're defining yourself by what you do. When I talk with my teams and I bring them on board and when I think about my own career, I try and create value because of who we are rather than just what we do. You try and grow beyond the technical ability, beyond the core skills there. And it's a really important mindset shift which allows you to A, think about why other people would care and why they buy into it, but also about you know, broadening out from the simple core skill set of doing what you do. Do you know the amount of people who see cycling around the world simply as a task of getting fitter than you've ever been, standing, standing on the start line, and let's see what happens? There's the far greater opportunity to use a, a journey like that as a vehicle for lots of other things, especially if you think it can, it can, it can give a legacy for you and those that you care around you afterwards. So I only mention that in passing, because that mindset is at the heart of what I've done with my teams over the years. And the blueprint for the planning always comes from this idea that you never do better than what you set out to do. As an athlete, it is not about getting to the gym, killing myself, and then standing on the start line, and let's see what happens. It's about do all the big thinking beforehand. Work it out as meticulously as you can. Build block programs. Figure out the behaviors and the inputs that are going to create the long-term averages that you desire and then go out there and read it off script. Maybe that takes the shine off it. Maybe that makes it sort of less romantic and wonderful than you hoped. But I tell you what, this is not about a match. This is not about a sprint. This is not about a moment in time where you can suffer and then that night you have a pint and a shower and you reflect on it. This is about things which last for weeks and months. And when you're out there for such long durations, putting yourself under such a huge amount of stress, and when you've got teams working around you, you better have a plan. There's, you might have watched in the press last week that Jenny Graham from Inverness came home and broke the female circumnavigation world record. Absolutely phenomenal ride. Three ladies have come to me in the last 18 months saying they wanted to break the female circumnavigation world record by bicycle. And when they all came to me, because I've pedaled around the planet twice, um, they came to me and said, could you help with the marginal gains, the border crossings, the nutrition, the detail that, that's allowed you to do what you've done? I said, look, I'll help you with any of that, open source. But... Question number one, what's your target? What are you actually trying to do? And all three of them said, well, we're, we're trying to break the record. Now, the record before for, on the women's side was 144 days. So if you go out there simply trying to repeat history a wee bit better, you'll probably do that. You'll create a marginal gain and you'll come home. And wherever you end up in life, you'll justify it. It's human nature. 
You'll, you'll, you'll say you left it all out here, you did your best. But remember what I said, you'll never do better than what you set out to do. So you have to do the big thinking before you leave. And so the process for, for those three ladies going for the record was to figure out, first and foremost, what they were capable of with their skill sets, their resources, with everything they had. R respecting what's gone before, do your research in history, but for goodness sake, don't base your targets on history. That's the dangerous game that most people, athletes, businesses, you name it, do. Incremental improvements, as opposed to taking a fresh sheet of paper and saying, what is the art of the possible? Now, that sounds like pie-in-the-sky marketing until you nail it into real-life examples. Um, and it was absolutely brilliant to watch Jenny smash that record by three weeks because she wasn't trying to break somebody else's record. She'd figured out what she was trying to do. Um, so to rattle through a decade of expeditions and to really focus on what we did last year, as David alluded to, there's been high altitude mountaineering. This is Denali in Alaska. There's trying to get a rowing boat further north than anyone's ever gone before, 800 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Did we row there? Well, we got the boat there. Um, trying to row the Atlantic. I mean, not all these expeditions have worked. Not for a lack of a plan, but simply because you cannot affect everything. When you're trying to do things which have not been done before, what, seven and a half billion people living on planet Earth, when you're trying to do things first or fastest, you have to have a plan. But ultimately, the psychology out there is understanding that you're controlling the inputs and the behaviors. And there's a whole lot else that you cannot affect. Safety has to come first. These things might be professional, they might be expensive, they might be worthwhile, but ultimately it's sport at the end of the day. You've got to keep that perspective because otherwise people die. And I've seen that happen. Um, the Atlantic, it nearly happened to me. 28 days in, 500 miles from the finish, thinking we had another world record in the bag, and this happened. And I'm not going to linger on this, but we spent a long time trying to be rescued, from going upside down, paddling around, trying to figure out what we needed in what order. This photograph was taken for their insurance purposes as we clambered from a six-man life raft onto a 180-meter Taiwanese cargo vessel in the middle of the night. Came home and there was, uh, there was a lot of thinking through, trying to figure out what came next. Um, I took two years out from being an athlete and presented the build-up to Glasgow 2014, which was a phenomenal journey, going around the entire Commonwealth, meeting, meeting the biggest names in sport, Usain Bolt, Sally Pearson, but also all these unsung heroes who were pulling on their national jersey for the first time, leaving their homes for the first time. Believe it or not, talking to thousands of people who were excited to go to Glasgow. Um, and uh, it, was, uh, it was an extraordinary journey. I loved it. But I came home and I was at the heart of that 11 days of sport, and the sum total was I sat down with my family first and foremost and I said, you know, I've loved this, I'm inspired, but I'm jealous. I can't take myself out of the equation. I want to be doing what they are doing. You know, being simple about it, I could do this, hold a microphone in 10 years' time. But there's only one time in my career that I can put all my cards on the table and figure out what that personal best is. And the part of that equation that had always bugged me as I'd watched with awe and with interest that people had bettered that first circumnavigation world record was that... There's always a compromise between your personal best as an athlete, what is possible in terms of the miles on the road and the sheer endurance of it, and the wild man element of where am I sleeping tonight, where's my next meal, clean water, and the rest of it. So the world record for any of these big journeys, the length of the Americas, length of Africa, around the world, they're not about how fast you can pitch your tent and how fast you can find your food. They're about how fast and far you can ride your bike. So inevitably, all these records will become unsupported, so fully supported records. The first time around on all these original trips were unsupported. So you've got to put a full support performance team around you and, and, and just make it about riding your bike. Mitigate all those unknowns and, 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 and risks. So I put together what was eventually a three-year plan. And that's really when I got back in touch with... Um, your team here at Napier. And um, it was all about coming back to the world. Um, these clips that you're seeing is from, are from 2015 and trying to break the, the Cairo to Cape Town world record. And on purpose, we didn't talk about the world. My name was still synonymous with cycling around the world. All these people had broken my record and sadly nobody knew about them because they'd not done it with any profile and, and the rest of it. So I knew that the moment I came back and said I was going for the world again, you know, that would be a... So I wanted to keep that until the 11th hour. And I wanted to do something that gave me the confidence and the learning to figure out what the plan should be and the credibility to raise the sponsorship to do it. So year one was about 
Africa. 6,000 miles. It's exactly a third of the world in terms of distance. So we thought that would really give me the calling card that was needed to step back up to the world. Um, those clips that you just saw were in more northern Botswana. I tell you what, I mean, of all my experiences, if I was to bottle a moment and share it with my daughters, you know, it would be at full flight on a bike with a giraffe cantering alongside me. Um, and if I was to go back and explore one continent further, uh, out of all these expeditions, it would be Africa. Do you see, this hasn't got a pointer, do you see the bag underneath my handlebars? That's my house, that's my tent, my sleeping bag, my sleeping roll. I mean, that's ultralight, that's a carbon DI2 racing setup. I'm carrying, what, seven, eight kilos of kit. Um, but that bag, you'd be crazy to go without, I never used it. Every night I rode to dark or well into the night, and every time I stopped, I never had to ask a second person for a meal to eat or a place to sleep, which I don't think would happen if you were cycling John O'Groats to Land's End. <laughs> so when I came back from Africa, all people wanted to know about, journalists in particular, was Ebola and line attacks and terrorism. And I said, look, of course you've got to be streetwise, of course you've got to be careful, but you've got to travel and make your own mind up. Uh, people are people. Um, so we took the Africa world record from 59 days down to 41 days, 10 hours, 22 minutes. Again, that is not a marginal gain. Interestingly, I think the Africa world record is prime for the taking. Because when I did it, there was still 800 kilometers of dirt road in southern Ethiopia and northern Kenya. As of the end of last year, there is an unbroken ribbon of tar the entire length of Africa. You could definitely go sub 40. <laughs> so if this is your game, come and chat to me afterwards. I've got the maps. And all the people on the right border crossings could go sub 40. Um, 2016, we started to build the team, build the plan. And this was what we deemed as the fastest possible 18,000 miles around the world. I won't bore you with the details, but start to think of all the, all the factors which are going to make you go faster. The topography, the road quality, the wind direction, the border cross. I mean, all the flight scheduling, the all the parts which are going to get you around the world as fast as possible. Now, this claim, around the world in 80 days, was not the punchline that we finished with. That was what we went out the moment we launched this project last April. Um, it's really important not to launch your plans in any walk of life until they're fully baked. You know, when people say to me all the time, what are you doing next? The answer is nothing until it's ready, because there's nothing worse than talking about something that doesn't happen. Um, that's just a precursor to any of the uh, questions at the end. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but no, the, the reality was the researcher who I recruited for this, I, I found in from academic publishing. He was not an athlete. Okay, he was a runner, but he, he wasn't. I chose somebody who knew nothing about ultra-endurance cycling because I wanted somebody who was very diligent and detailed but didn't have any bias, didn't have any prior experience, didn't have any of the, well, this is the way we've done it from before. I wanted to take myself out of the equation and all that mega detailed half year of research to be done for somebody who had the right process, but no bias, no priors in the game. And then I started to recruit the team between media, broadcasting, and performance to actually scale this up and whatnot. So we're going, this time we're going from Paris to Beijing, across Australia, up New Zealand, five and a half thousand miles across North America. And then what we always joked about is the sprint finish, which is 1,100 miles up through Europe. So once we figured out that it was a rational plan to get around the world in 80 days, the record until, until before this was 123 days. To make an excuse for how slow I went first time around, um, it had gone from a, you know, an unsupported record to a mainly supported record. Andrew Nicholson, who had it before, was a New Zealander, a, a, an Olympic athlete, and uh, he was fully supported in the Southern Hemisphere and unsupported for a lot of the Northern Hemisphere. So it was on that sliding scale, moving towards fully supported. What I had was not a like-for-like. Like. It was an all-bells-and-whistles race with a full support set. <coughs> uh, very, very different first time around. Do you know how difficult it was launching this plan? Because even though people loved the idea, I mean, you don't need to be a PR genius to get the hook. I mean, 80 days, that is a bit of a one-time prize, isn't it? Um, and it, not just here in the UK, if you were to go anywhere around the world... Around the world in 80 days means something. That is a known phrase. You know, who was the second person to climb Everest? Who was the second person to run a four-minute mile? But when, I, when we rationally figured out the block program to make that possible, which was 75 days of cycling, three days flights, two days contingency, it, even though it was very rational and very sort of, we were talking about behaviors and inputs, not just, well, that would be fun. 
um, a lot of people said, well, that's nuts because there's no reference point for it. If the record's 123 days, how do you think you can go nearly 40%, well, over 40%, well, you know, quicker? And I, a number of would-be sponsors said, wouldn't you be better keeping that up your sleeve for the finishing line? Wouldn't it be better just to um, go out there and say, I'm trying to break the record? And then what a story on the finish if you went sub-80. But what I felt pretty strongly was, if I turned around to my team, all these people working hard to make this happen for me, and said, look, we're trying to break the record, and if everything goes really well, we might just go sub-80. You're never going to go sub-80. Not a chance. Not if your reference points and language for success is one, two, three. That's very confusing. Also, in terms of the earned media value and telling the story, I got the hook. This is not about the punchline on the finish. That, you know, the, 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 the media would be throughout the journey, not just what happened at the end. So understanding how media has moved on from the first time around when it was all about the documentary afterwards is pretty important when you have those conversations. So because that was a rational plan, we claimed it before we did it. But it, it created a lot of problems. Um, so this is a very low-key departure from, from, from Paris last July. And I've spent most of the talk talking about what it took to build towards this and the mindset and whatnot, as opposed to the actual nuts and bolts of how you ride the bike. But that minute trailer that you saw at the start explains some of the routine. And it's pretty brutal. Your alarm goes off at half past three, out your scratcher, on the bike at four. Four times four hour sets, those are things you control. Time on the bike, recovery time, nutrition, hydration, those are very simple inputs. How far you go is dictated by all the things you don't affect. You've mitigated as much as you can, but the way the wind blows, the topography and all the rest of it. So you can't base your psychology, your happiness, your, your, you know, your, by how far. If you said, I have to do a distance every day, it would be a psychological roller coaster. If you say, I'll put the same effort in, then the long-term average should, would take care of itself. And that's what we've seen over and over, over the years. But the average we had to hit was 240 miles a day. So 240 from here will get you just into Wales. Three weeks ago, as you'll find out in a minute, uh, in conversation with Leslie, I, put, I flipped this entire project on its head. Rather than me going around the world again, I said, why don't, because a lot of people said to me, I wonder if I could do one day of what you did every single day for two and a half months. So I said, well, let's do it. So I recruited 80 riders to do a 240 miler with me. It's actually a 245. We went from Campbelltown to Aberdeen. And so we went around the world in a day, if that makes any sense. So that was the concept. And so many of these people that had said, I wonder what a day in the life is like. We, we did it, we lived it. And we'll ask Leslie when she came, comes up what that was like. Um, so quite different to first time round. I've got one job. In the nine weeks between the training ride, which was a 3,000 miler around the coastline of Britain, and the actual world itself, I had a process to hand over the leadership to my team and I say, right, it's your job to get me around the world now. I've got one job. Like, this would fail in terms of skill set and capacity. Anyone who's done endurance sports will know you go to idiot mode when you're out there. There's nothing sort of... So you have to make sure that you've got the team who are doing the big thinking and looking after, out for your safety. We had a flying start. Six countries in six days took us through Europe to the Russian border. We had a westerly. We had phenomenal conditions. And my biggest worry was getting some silly repetitive strain injury in the first week and just not being able to hit the numbers. But luckily, we had the conditions on our side. This photograph is taken on day nine. We'd cleared Moscow on day eight, 260 miler. And day nine at five o'clock in the morning, I crashed hard. And when I took the crash, it was with my outstretched hand and my face. The result was fracturing my radio head, so I put a crack through my left elbow. I had four wobbly teeth down the left-hand side of my jaw, and my canine tooth was sort of cracked in two. So this photograph is Laura, my physiotherapist, and Alex, my bike mechanic, learning to, learning to rebuild teeth on the roadside in Russia. This photograph is taken just east of the Ural Mountains. The British Embassy had come out and reached us about two, three days later to bring us resin to rebuild teeth. We didn't have that. Um, so literally met us at the roadside and then they did that. So thank you them. That's where your taxpayer money goes. Um, <laughs> um, the relief to get through that first swathe, Russia, Mongolia, China, all the cultural unknowns was huge. Two days after touching down in Perth, Australia, we cracked the one-month record, the most miles ever cycled in a month. 
which was just over 7,000 miles, which I'm not flippant about, but I also always knew we would do that if we were on track for the 80 days. But it was amazing to see the psychological lift, the boost that gave my team around me, because I'm the guy who can rationalize the 80 days. I'm the guy on the bike who's actually doing that. Everyone else is buying into what I believe is possible and getting busy with their jobs. So to give everyone around me that first tangible rung on the ladder, that first moment of, we're doing this, all that sleep deprivation, that hard work is worth it and paying off, was quite incredible. But to give you a sense of what's happening off the bike, I mean, from wheels touching down in Perth, Australia, to me riding out, was 35 minutes. And that was the detail that had to happen all the way through. We could save a ton of time off the bike as well as on the bike with the right people in place. And that's where all the research went. That's where all the investment went. Um, some pretty empty miles in the other side of the world. This is winter. And the only time we stretched this 16 hours a day routine, 16 hours every single day, was when we were within striking distance of a, a transit, be it a plane or a boat or whatever it was to get us to the next wave. Because... If we got a more favourable transit, we could suddenly save 6, 12, 18 hours on the block programme. Even the whole width of North America, we couldn't make 12 hours back unless we were doing 250 miles plus every single day. So think, the efficiencies off the bike actually mean more than on the bike as long as you do the hours on the bike. Something I stressed before we left, if we faffed, it's a, te it's a technical term, if we faffed for five minutes every time I was off the bike, that would add over a day to the world record. So it wasn't about doing more, riding faster, riding harder. It was about being utterly consistent with the inputs we could control and trusting the long-term average would take care of itself. Um, so messing around with the plan, obviously there was a lot of transits on the other side of the world, down to New Zealand, up to the North Island. So we did the entire, south, uh, the entire length of New Zealand in less than five days, which was absolutely brutal and unsustainable. But we only asked the team to go unsustainable, go into the red for a short period of time, knowing I would then get recovery on the flight, hit reset, and then go back to the 16 hours a day. We weren't just going out there and going hell for leather and try and push it harder and harder every day. We were doing what we knew was sustainable because we had to do this for two and a half months. Um, the graveyard shift. I mean, four, five, six o'clock in the morning. You are not inspired. You are hurting like hell, and you're just getting the job done. You are not thinking about Paris. You're absolutely focused on the next horizon you can see. Get through breakfast. Warm up a bit. Get, you know, a lot of type two fun, if you know what I mean by that. That's the stuff you look back on fondly. That's the career-defining, life-affirming stuff, which is kind of what makes us human. Um, but, you know, anyone can do type one fun. But... Sitting in the pub is type one fun. When you're sitting in the pub, you tend to be talking about this stuff, right? And it's good to think about it in that way. Here is one of the many clips that we put out, and it sort of shows you where I was on the road. It's uh, start, start at 47, and um, yeah, slept, slept deeply, but uh, only for just over four hours. So. Um, Woke a couple of times hearing the rain on the night. Uh, Laura's looked at the weather charts and the, uh, and um, it's quite a big storm coming this morning. Uh, you can feel the wind moving the motor home, and it's right on the nose. Nikki, uh, Nikki, stop showing the kids my morning videos. <laughs> Finally, Daddy looks quite scary. Um, the only reason I showed you that really is because. That bit I said about reading it off script. If you were to wake up in a moment like that, and there was many moments like that, at half past three, four o'clock, and everything's going against you, I don't think anyone is psychologically strong enough to hit the numbers, to do their best possible in terms of the average, if they've not taken, they've not created an escape hatch. They've, they've made those decisions before they're in those moments. This is not a moment where you turn around to your team and say, what are we going to do today? Because you'll do less. You get on the bike, you do 16 hours. You might go less, but the effort that day counts just as much as the next or the last in terms of hitting the numbers long term. And it takes the imagination out of it. You know, people often say to me, you're such an inspired person to be able to do this day after day after day. No, I'm not. Do I look inspired? You know, don't give me some Muhammad Ali quote. I don't know what to do with that. In that moment, when you're hurting like hell, when the storm is raging, when you're at your lowest ebb, you're normally running away from failure more than running, running to success. You're accountable. You're in it. You're living it. You've chosen to be there. 
you've made a plan, you're reading it off script. It's a very difficult place to describe, but I'd never want to wrap it up in any sort of heroics, because it's, it's not. It's just a simple process, and you look at the team, they know what they're doing, you know what you're doing, you've committed to the process and you do it. It takes any of the big questions or the escape hatches off the table. The belief in this project was incredible through the second half. It went from people at the start saying we were nuts and this was impossible to just this unblinking belief that we were going to do it. This dude road tripped with us for over a thousand miles through North America. But <laughs> the, the, the amount of people coming out back in the English speaking world, Australia, New Zealand, North America, to be a part of it was extraordinary. It actually became a bit of a challenge um, because, you know, I was in quite a fragile state coming through um, the US that's pedaling out under the northern lights. I mean, you're going every sunrise, every sunset for two and a half months, you know, uh, nigh on a thousand miles every, every four days. But, but, but that level of interest and whatnot was, was difficult. I mean, I wasn't allowed to see the social media and the wider media around it, but I was seeing what was happening on the road around me. And Laura, who's used to working with Olympians, at, uh, is, was very confused by this reality of, you know, if her athletes at Rio or London suddenly had the fans and the public riding alongside or running alongside whilst they competed, you know, that would be, that would be odd, wouldn't it? I mean, um, and yet here I was going for a world record and, you know, every day tens of people were coming out to have a, a Sunday ride with me. And, you know, she, she wanted that professional separation, whereas me, from the, an adventure background, from a wilderness background, I was like, oh, this is wonderful. You know, so many people wanting to be a part of it, but she could see the numbers. She could see psychologically how fragile I was. She was, she was trying to protect me. So that was an interesting balance between me going, I can't believe people have made such an effort and there's such a community around this, to her going, you know, this is two months in, you're in a very dark place, and we need to, we need to some way protect you from that. Um... To give you an example, I mean, there was days when I'd get off the bike coming through the Great Lakes and back up to the east coast of the US, which I can't remember. And I'm not talking about now, looking back. I mean, off the bike that evening, half past nine, ten o'clock at night, Laura would reflect on the day that was, 400 kilometers or whatever, and I didn't know what she was talking about. I'm sure you've all driven to Glasgow and can't quite remember the M8, but can you imagine riding 250 miles and not being able to remember it? That's when you have to have a team that you trust, looking out for your safety, and you've taken yourself to a really, really deep place. It's not very helpful when you're trying to write the book either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but as an athlete, this is definitely the darkest place I've ever taken myself. You've got to trust the team. The right... The, 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 the race, I mean, the relief to arrive back in Lisbon in that final 1,100 miles, pushing up through Madrid over the Pyrenees back to Paris was extraordinary. And the final ride in, I mean, the, the culmination of any big project always feels different when you're at the heart of it. You know, you can sit there and dream it up and think of it in terms of the big... and imagine it 10,000 times in terms of how you feel. You won't. And I don't say that to take away from the final success of whatever you you take on just the reality of when you're in it, at the coalface, pushing a project. And it's been the same for all the big journeys and records and firsts over the years. When you actually complete a point that you've visualized so many times, it's a bit odd. You're slightly rabbits in the headlight because everyone around you is kind of experiencing the motions that you thought that you would. Everyone around you is just euphoric for you. And you're at the heart of it. And it's impossible for you to zoom out from the micro to the macro, to see it other than just these four-hour blocks that you've been living for two and a half months to the world and to add it up to the sum of its parts. And the greatest emotion related to any great success is relief, <laughs> which is very, a, bit, a bit of an anticlimax, isn't it? But, but when, when these things mean so much and you put so much pressure on yourself and your team around you, the best it feels is an incredible sense of relief and you look around and pride in the team who have made it possible with you. When you look back and every conversation and every purpose is about making the bike go faster and you think back over the years to every conversation and every risk to even give yourself the opportunity to do something like this, there is nothing inevitable about it. There is nothing sure-footed about it. And it's important, as I say, to call out those myths and legends. Um, there's our finishing line picture. It's got the one month and the world. There's a better one. There's the team. There's the clan. Um, but what we did last year um, has really got people talking because we smashed the previous world record by 
or we broke our target by 1.77%. So the new circumnavigation world record is 78 days, 14 hours, 40 minutes. 78 days, 14 hours, 40 minutes. The target was 75 days riding, three days flights, two days contingency. So emotionally, and we all do this, emotionally, that was my personal best. I left it all out there, as did my team. My God, they suffered. Everyone committed incredibly. But let's be rational once again. We used 14 hours out of our 48 hours contingency. I spoke to a journalist not so long ago and he said, yeah, yeah, I get that and the way you talk about it, but you crashed three times, you had some big storms, lots of bad luck, you get rid of all that and you'll go that much quicker. That sounds logical, but it's not. It's not logical. It's, it's absolutely about before you start figuring out the art of the possible, Getting a team to buy into that, defining those roles, and then reading it off script. Which, as I said before, I think probably spoils the illusion for some people. But I hope for anyone with big ambitions in sport or otherwise, gives them some reassurance around the process it actually takes to take acorns of ideas to, um, to where you think you can go with them. And I'll finish with a very, very simple thought, which is, I am six foot three and 90 kilos. I am not the world's best bike rider. It is, it is, it has got to be more than the technical ability to do the job. It's about taking a sideways look at the possible. It's about building a team that can, can properly buy into what you think is possible as opposed to just protecting themselves and going, well, let's try and do better than we did last year or beat next best. That simple process is incredibly powerful. And it's been at the heart of all the projects I've taken on over the years. And we've had a lot of fun with it. But you go from people go calling you crazy to then you do it. And people go, well, that was inevitable. That was the next best. That was, that was, that was. People talk about the 80 days like it was the next big prize in endurance cycling. No, it wasn't. Nobody else was talking about it. We took the record from 123 days down to 78. And it'll be interesting to see what comes next. Because I'll tell you for free, I'm not going to cycle around the world again. <laughs> So on that note, let's get Leslie up here and have a chat about how Napier helped out to make this happen. There we go. What's that? I think we should stand up. Are you happy with that? Yeah, absolutely. We were going to sit down, but we're not going to. We're, at, we're athletes, aren't we? Um, Leslie, first of all, before we get into the geeky uh, sports science, um, what was the Coast to Coast like? Well, I think I would say I definitely have a different de definition of type 2 fun to what Mark has. <laughs> um, it was fairly brutal. Um, and if you asked me on the second day to get out of my bed again at 3 o'clock in the morning, there was no chance that was going to happen. It was, it was amazing to see the emotions from... We only had two people drop out, and that was because of in injuries, um, which is pretty phenomenal, because 240 is a stretch target for anyone, right? I mean, you know, no, nobody, whether you're a roadie or a tourer, you know, finds that easy. But the psychology of it, I mean, it's interesting because a lot of people set out and were like, well, this is a pretty easy pace. Yeah, it is. But you're going to be doing it for the next 16 hours. <laughs> and, um, and actually, on day one of the, of the, of the road, we had Cy Richardson from GCN, uh, Global Cycling Network, ride with me. And he's an ex-pro. And for the first six hours, he was blethering away going, yeah, this is all right. I could do this. And then for the next 10 hours, he just sat on my wheel. And then, and, then, and then after 16 hours, he said, that's the hardest day I've ever had on a bike. But it's, it, it is a different mindset, isn't it? But it was, I mean, you have to admit, when we got to Duffy Park in Aberdeen, the, the relief and the emotions and the camaraderie with everyone was pretty special. Absolutely. And I think it was such a lovely journey through the day with all these riders. We didn't necessarily all know each other. It was, there was a lot of learning through that. My favourite part of the day, I think, was actually Alex Glasgow, who was a mechanic that you saw in Motor Army of Magnitude, and he broke two. And we got to the second stop and I was like, Alex, I look knackered, I feel knackered. You know, how are you feeling? And he said, I saw Mark on day 60 and he looked worse than you and you're definitely going to be able to do this. I thought, okay, we can get through this. <laughs> yeah, no, it was pretty special. And, and between, between all the riders raised 84,000 uh, for, for the STV Children's Appeal, which was phenomenal. Um, so when I, when I first sort of got in touch again and said, look, we're off, we're off around the planet, there was a fine balance, wasn't there, between all that experience doing ultra-endurance and layering on the lab testing and the, and the sports science and what you could bring to the party. 
what were your, what were your thought processes, and then you know what 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 did you think would help most at that point? Well, I guess the first time I met you when you came to Napier, my first thought process was actually, blooming heck, how is he actually going to manage to fit all of this into a day? Um, so Mark came and he, he told me the numbers of what he wanted to cycle. Just for those of you that don't know me, I study sleep, so I'm a big advocate of having enough sleep in a day. <laughs> and I thought, there's no way he's getting eight hours sleep a day the minute I went home to do the calculations. So, you know, I guess as a team, we just really sat down and we thought what was achievable and what wasn't. Um, there was lots of things that maybe we had to bend rules slightly on because we didn't know some of the outcomes. We didn't know sometimes how far we could push Mark, but we definitely put all of that into motion while we were actually conducting all of the training and we had practice runs of everything. So by the time we actually got to Around the World, I thought we, the team were as confident as we could be. There was obviously always a little bit of worry because you never know what's going to happen, but I think you know we absolutely put everything into place that we certainly could. And there was, I mean, there was a lot of conversations. I mean, I guess a lot of the athletes you've worked with before are racing. So what they do is over in, you know, a cyclocross race will be 45 minutes to an hour, a mountain bike race might be a matter of hours, a, a road race might be over in five, six, seven hours, it's maybe some stage races, but ultimately you can ride to fail. We couldn't ride to fail. And it, I mean, some of the testing we did in the lab, sort of ramp tests and tests to fail, were interesting in one sense, but I guess my numbers wouldn't be that impressive on the grand scale of, you know, Olympians and Commonwealth athletes, but what I've you know, a lot of the conversations we were having was, yes, but how do we stretch this over and make it sustainable as opposed to a race to fail? And then, and then layering on all the nutrition and how we actually fuel this. Absolutely. And your numbers are different, for sure. But your numbers are different in a good way. So your numbers are different because you're an ultra-endurance athlete and you're not an Olympian. So my job was to take those numbers and actually get the best out of those numbers I possibly yeah. could. And that's the difference. So it's about working with the athlete to get the best out of the athlete you possibly can as opposed to comparing yourself to Chris yeah. Froome or... And actually I went through a couple of bike fitters because, you know, it was quite hard to find people who, who sort of took the athlete in front of them and the bike in front of them and tried to... Find, find the incremental improvements as opposed to starting from some theoretical, um, you know, perfect state and say, well, you need to do that. Because, I mean, I remember some of those early conversations, not with yourself, but with other people on the performance team where we would say, well, you need to completely relearn what you do. And then I had to re remember that, you know, I have actually ridden a few hundred thousand miles and I do know how to ride a bike. And, 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 and there's, there's a fine balance between, isn't there, the, the theory and the sports science and then, and then working with all the, you know, the the experience and the idiosyncrasies and the, of, of the athlete and the individual in front of you. And I think that's what, I mean, that's what Leslie's quite good at, you know, taking, taking the theory and the, the science. And also work quite closely with a, a great friend of Leslie's, Ruth uh, McKean, who's a, a nutritionist, because it became about how do we eat your way around the world. Um, and 8,500, 9,000 calories is a, is a fair chunk. Uh, do you want to reflect on some of the conversations about the fueling? Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the feeling was to try and consume 9,000 calories in a day is quite a feat for anyone. Um, and I guess we always, um, with Mark, were, we wanted to make sure that in terms of the fueling, I mean, this was definitely um, Ruth's background, but to make sure that we got the absolute best out of his performance based on the fueling. And very, very sort of fat adapted, not what you'd imagine. I mean, you can't have 9,000 calories of spaghetti. Um, you know, just try it. You know, so it was, it was, very, it was, very, it was very dense calories, slow release. You know, it was like being a diesel engine, wasn't it? It was about that long, that slow release. And we did, we did the, the, the final did we, thing we did in the final month or two was get into the climate chamber and did some really interesting tests around sort of sweat and, you know, different climatical. And, and I mean, those numbers were pretty telling. Absolutely. So, again, being at Napier, one of the, the best things that we were able to do is to use all of the wonderful equipment that we have. So we actually have a climatic chamber where we can control heat and humidity. Um, so Mark obviously was starting over in Europe, and at that time the 
we had not too bad weather for Scotland, but it was still relatively cold. So we were able to actually bring him into the heat chamber to try and acclimatise him so that by the time he got out there, he wasn't expending any unnecessary energy trying to do that for the challenge. So every stone was unturned. We basically, as a team, we were all working together continually to try and make sure that he was never going to go into to start this challenge in any form of decrement. And he was going in there absolutely all guns blazing. Let's try and nail this. And then obviously for the base camp team on the performance side, there was quite a feedback loop going on when I was on the road based on, you know, I stood in the scales first thing every morning, half past three. We did saliva swabs, which show your, uh, I guess, your immunology, you know, where I was in terms of, you know, getting an infection or getting ill out there was, was, was one of my biggest risks when you're so battered. Um, but it also shows like, your cortisol level and your stress hormone. I mean, we could see a lot of detail whilst we were going, and there was a lot of feedback loop between uh, Dr. Andrew Murray, sports doc, and Leslie and Ruth, and, and all the teams sort of feeding in to make sure that this was ultimately, ultimately sustainable. So, great team. Yeah, uh, over to you guys. Um, you can ask about whatever you wish. There's an arm right at the back to kick things off. Go for it. And there's a, there's a, mic, there's a microphone with you. Yeah. Obviously inspiring. Um, you, you mentioned, and obviously just even the conversation just now, is all about a, a class of physiology. Yeah. But actually, given mental health awareness, I'm actually much more interested about the psychology. So who is your support when it's really dark? Because the only thing that's getting you through that is you. And it's, you need the backup that you're fueled. But who's fueling your mind to keep going? Yeah, so, so there was not a psychologist on board, but I did put together an incredible team with real depth. So I made sure that it goes back to that thing I said. They were employed because of who they were, not just what they did. It wasn't just our physio, our logistics manager, who, you know, for those component parts. I needed people who had grit, you know, that wonderful four-letter word. And that comes from life experience. You know, that very much is about your priors, what you've done, how you cope under pressure. Interestingly, three people left the project last year and it was never because of their core ability to do the job. It was always because of their changes of behaviour under pressure when you turn the heat up. So, so that's at the heart of it. And for me, you know, I guess I'm quite hard to work with them on the road when I get the blinkers up and I'm racing. But I always justify that by saying, you know, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm hard on other people, I'm harder on myself. I've got to put myself into a frame of mind where the race is that way, not that way. There's very little space for small talk and... It's interesting because you can hand over the leadership of the project in terms of the logistics and the nuts and the bolts, but at the heart of a project, you will never hand over the emotional leadership. So people always look to you. If you smile, everyone smiles. If you look worried, so does everyone. Um, but the psychology of it, you know, as I alluded to with that, with that sort of early morning video you saw, it's, it's very much about not what you've learned in the lab or in the gym your ability to be a bike rider, but it's purely your ability to think your way through the task. Um, I think anyone who is very successful in, in business and in sport gets very, very good at fixating on where they are trying to get to, and then they get very, very good at operating within the horizons they affect. And in the middle ground, it doesn't exist. It can get truncated. It doesn't matter, because that's all the what-ifs and the noise that will absolutely cloud your judgment and your focus to get through. You know, so I, when it actually comes to that period of performance, the 80 days and the Arc de Triomphe matters, and the next four hours matter. The rest, I'm not there yet. And that's why you need a team who have different levels of objectivity on the task. So they're clearing the road ahead of you, literally, making sure that all the, all the what-ifs have been thought through and the contingencies. But the, 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 the strength of mind to actually think your way through the task definitely comes from you know, all the building blocks up to that, the 12-year-old boy up to what I've done now. And that's why I think it's very interesting to see who will come next, because, I mean, I, I want that to happen. I'd love to see this record contested. But it, it's unlikely to be a tour rider. It's unlikely to be somebody who is a phenomenal road racer, because it's as much about the mind game as it is about the physical. In fact, the longer the distance, I think the more it's about the mind and the, the less it's about the physical, you know. There's two more hands there. Whilst you're, whilst you're going up there, what I should say is the psychology afterwards is also very interesting because you can plan yourself through a task, but it's very difficult to... I think anyone who takes on any big project like this 
always has a real roller coaster off the back of it. And that's, that's, in terms of mental health, that's worth talking about. You don't live on cloud nine, and it's a real, it's a real thing to readjust from. Yeah, that's, that, that's definitely true. Yes, one of the microphones here. Go for it. I just wondered, um, having the picture of your family up there, uh, from my own experience, um, the family is a backbone. Yeah. And I wondered how, I suppose it's together you manage it, but as you said, that it goes up and down. Uh, you come off the cloud nine, yeah. but they're at home, and they yeah. haven't done that journey. So I wonder how... I mean, I mean, obviously, Nikki supports me brilliantly, but I always think that she supports me blindly because she's not an athlete. She doesn't, she's, she's not lived any of these journeys. She, doesn't, she, she supports me because she's my wife and she loves me, but she's, not, it's, she's actually not the right person to speak to when I'm going through some of the psychological highs and lows because... She's not got any reference points. Uh, and, and that's the case for all of us if we're really struggling with things professionally. You know, often turning to the people who are closest to you is, is not the right solution. You need wise counsel. We all need people around us who we, who we love and trust. But give us a completely impartial, objective discussion around, around the challenges. And, and, and I think it's really important to know when you can draw on the strength of your family and where you need external support especially when you're in a leadership role, because if you constantly turn to your partner, you're, it's, they're on that psychological journey with you. They're too invested. Um, what I would say is, you know, people have often said to me, wouldn't it be easier to do these things if you were you know, young, free, and single, like I was when I started in this game? You know, it's quite a selfish endeavor at the end of the day. But the reality is, when you take it to this extreme, um, as you alluded to, I think it would be very difficult to do these things to this extreme without that sense of home, that base camp, that, that, that support. Because it is not about the task of getting on the bike and turning the pedals. You know, I didn't talk about it much, but it's the, it's the roller coaster to get these things financed, to get these things to the start line. When you're, when you're trying to pull these projects together, I mean, that's when you, when you have the sleepless nights thinking, what am I doing? You know, this is nuts. And we had those conversations last year when you're quarter of a million down on budget and you're in the final months before you need to go and you should be focused on training and you're, you're running around firing people on your team and trying to, trying to raise the cash. You know, th this is the reality of any big project and it's not what you see afterwards when you just see a guy on the bicycle. So that's when you need the support and love of, 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 of those who are close to you, absolutely for sure. And if I can just jump in there, that's certainly where I think as a team we would try and take things away from Mark. So we would try and reduce that noise so when we knew it was becoming too difficult or too, there was so much noise going on, we would, our, we would absolutely focus that. And our message as a team was very direct. And actually, we would work through Laura and Laura yeah. right at the end of the project was the only person that actually had the communication with Mark because we as a team were so united and making sure that that message was... That was a good point. So I, 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 as the team got bigger and bigger, um, you know, there was only so much in terms of capacity and... You know, and, and all the messaging had to be absolutely, um, you know, in agreement as well. So, so because Laura was performance manager on the road, she ended up sort of pulling together all those conversations that were happening from the performance team back in the UK, um, rather than me having, you know, six, seven or eight, nine conversations. Um, and that was massively useful. But, but, it, but as I say, the, sa the same existed on the logistics side and the media side. We, we, we tried to make sure by the time we got to the task, I had one job. Um, yeah, it, it is interesting because I think it's, it's slightly different from how people imagine it. I think people imagine if we hadn't had the conversation we'd had in the last sort of uh, 50, 55 minutes, you might think that it's just about get on your bike, you know, pedal around Arthur's seat a few thousand times and then, you know, get to the start line and go, come on, let's have you 18,000 miles. Let's see what's possible. That is the opposite to what we did. And I think that's, that's quite interesting. Yeah, go for it. Um, I feel like I've got 101 questions, but um, I guess so much of this is about uh, like physical training and, and preparing yourself um, in that way. The, the, the cycling training, normally if you're preparing for the Tour de France or anything like that, is, is probably fairly well documented. Yeah. Um, but ultra-endurance training is, is presumably there's not 
that much out there. No, and I think um, that's why the data set that we've now got is probably quite interesting. And so what were you, what were you kind of, without just uh, aiming to ride your bike a lo for a long, long way, what were you sort of focusing on? What was the kind of... Yeah. So in terms of training, the worst sort of training you can do is just going out and doing big miles. It's the mistake that a lot of ultra-endurance riders make. A, <laughs> it's boring, believe it or not, pot kettle black. Um, but it also, it doesn't... I mean, the, we all have sort of physical oddities when we overtrain. And ultra-endurance is just a permanent state of overtraining. Um, so, you know, for example, my right knee comes out when I'm tired on the bike, 14, 15, 16 hours in. So just going out and riding, tempo riding at the pace you're going to be doing on the world doesn't really give you that all-round strength um, conditioning to endure what would eventually be 1,200 hours in the saddle. So the training was a lot more varied and a lot more intense than you might imagine. So a lot of, you know, cadence sets, power sets, pyramid sets, you know, a lot of time, you know, doing horrible walk bike sessions and whatever else it took, I would go, I would do one long fell run every week. Most cyclists will never run, but I'll run off-road because it strengthens up the knees and the ankles. You know, when, it, when you get tired, all those small muscle balances and the things which are ultimately going to give you the, it was only in the last two, three months that we really, three months that we transitioned all that form, fitness, if you like, into the conditioning to actually endure 16 hours a day on the bike. And that's when it more just comes about the contact points, just the, the, the ability to suffer that time on the bike. Um, so it was only really, you know, we did a... I think the, the fittest I was was probably last February. I was certainly my leanest, my most powerful. You know, all the testing had absolutely come to a climax after spending a month training in Spain last January. And if you were to put me into a crit race or a road race, that's when I was absolutely at my leanest and meanest. We then transitioned into ultra endurance mode and, you know, made sure that I had the form to actually suffer that amount of time on the bike. And of course, by the time I came back, you know, my numbers wouldn't have been quite so impressive. You'd lose your top end. You don't, you're not, you don't have that sprint or that power anymore, but you, you've just got the ability to sit zone one, zone two for 16 hours a day, which is a very different task. The, the art with Mark as well was that he was also working full time and he had a family. So it wasn't just an aim of getting someone to go out and train meaningless hours. It was every hour he trained counted. And that was really the ethos right from the beginning. So why are you doing that session? And if that session is not important, then we are going to scrap that because we can use that for another set of time. And that was a balance. Yeah. I mean, in one way, you say, well, it would be perfect if you didn't have to go out and do all the fundraising and the partnerships and the media and all the other things that I had to do in the last six months. I mean, that would be great. But by the time it came to it, you know, because there'd been so many setbacks and failures, you know, and I'd had to invest more in the project myself than I ever imagined I would, you know, that level of having skin in the game, accountability, knowing every part of the project definitely sets yourself up. If, 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 if the opposite had happened, and this was all organised for me, and then we stood in the start line and, and my team said, right, Mark, on the bike, off you go. And I just spent a year riding my bike. I don't think it would have put me in the same mindset of being on the start line going, I can't fail. We've got a plan. The big picture scares the hell out of me. If I think of two, three, four days, you know, but if I just think about the next four hours, there's no part of this in terms of the smallest block program that I can't do. Um, and so I think that was less than optimal in terms of my ridiculous schedule, but actually put me... In a, in a very, very committed state by the start line. What was weird at the start line was because I'd outsourced everything to my team, it's the first time I've ever got to the start line in a project and I had nothing to do. That last 24 hours before Paris, normally you start an expedition and you're running around like a blue RSB just trying to, trying to and you're exhausted on the start line. I, I had nothing to do that last 24 hours and it was a very dangerous place to be. You know, my head was going nuts. I just wanted to get on the bike and start pedaling. With, yeah. Go for it. Um, it was a related question, I think. Um, but at the other end of the, uh, of the whole thing, um, when you've gone through such physical extremes, sort of fitness-wise, do you really have to manage your fitness afterwards? Um, yeah, and it certainly wasn't about trying to maintain that level of fitness. I mean, 
When I first came back and took media interviews in Paris and walked around the streets, my lower back hurt, my lower legs hurt. I hadn't really walked for two and a half months. You know, I'd stepped into the RV each night and stepped out in the morning, got on the bike and rode. So when you're in that position, no, oh, wrong pictures. Oh, these are pictures I meant to show you. Um, <laughs> when you're in that position for 16 hours a day for two and a half months, you know, your hips are rotated in, your shoulders are forwards. You know, unless you want to walk around like a duck for the rest of your life, you've got work to do. So there was a bit of stretching. I mean, if you'd asked me to ride 400k, no problem. If you'd asked me to walk 10, I'd have struggled. So normalizing my fitness, straightening up, doing very low impact stuff to begin with, getting into the swimming pool, walking the dog, building up. You know, we did a DEXA scan, what, about a month, no, two, three weeks after it came out, quite yeah, soon after. Weeks, yeah. And I can't remember the numbers, but my bone density was down a wee bit, wasn't it? Yeah, so that was one of our main concerns with Mark, because obviously he wasn't, we knew that he wasn't going to be weight bearing for the whole time he was actually doing challenge. So we were just really concerned that how much bone density would he lose during that time. And we did see a drop in that, but, yeah. um, you know, through proper management, we've not done a one since, but... Yeah, so we did it straight He's afterwards. standing up okay and he yeah. looks okay, so... But, I mean, I mean, anecdotally, you know, I couldn't have done the running and all the other sports that I'm now, I'm now doing. And it was actually interesting this year because I transitioned very quickly after sort of two and a half months of training down. Uh, by the time we got to the start of this year, I wanted to give myself a completely different target. There was no point in psychologically or physically training to do ultra-endurance again. So I, on purpose, chose a challenge this year. That was about top-end threshold power. So I went for the, you know, the hour record on a penny farthing, um, <laughs> which was set in 1886. Um, so if you're racing a 54-inch penny farthing around a velodrome, you know, it's all about high cadence threshold power. So I kind of chose that because, A, it's fun, and, and, and B, it was just taking my body in a completely different direction, and it felt like quite a good antidote after last year. And your threshold did increase because I yeah, tested yeah. you just after that, so... Yeah, so if you want to if you want if you want if you want to break the um, if you want to break the the penny farthing hour record, you've got to be able to because you're literally pedalling the wheel and it's a 54 inch wheel. You've got to hold a cadence of 125 with a with a power output of about 350 for an hour, uh, and you're going around a banked velodrome, so it's uh, it's quite exciting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And your arms hurt as much as your legs because every time you pedal, you you it turns the wheel. So you know you you pedal if you pedal properly in terms of sort of you know, pushing through the top, pulling through the bottom like you're taught to, um, then that obviously turns the wheel as you go. So your triceps hurt as much as your legs do. So you need to go back to good old-fashioned stomping like an absolute punter on the bike. And, um, and yeah, that was, that was good fun. There's quite a few other hands, but I've also got one eye on the clock. I'm looking to uh, the team to know what we should do. Should we take one more? One, yeah. one more question. And then if there's other questions, come and chat to me and Leslie... Uh, afterwards, please, please do. I've actually done uh, a few endurance events like yourself, but I've always done it with other cyclists. Yeah. And uh, not on your scale, I should hasten to add, by any means. But um, <laughs> I've always had other cyclists with me. Um, the thought of doing it alone, which you obviously did, um, is very daunting. What conversations did you have with yourself in the hours that the support crew were, were not there? Well, I mean, the support crew were always there. I mean, there was never a moment when they weren't on my back wheel. Um, so, but, of course, you've got a massive amount of headspace. I mean, what don't you think about when you've got 1,200 hours on your own? Um, there's moments when you are absolutely fixated on the details of the ride, like any race, you know, the numbers. You know, you sit there looking, doing multiples of what's on the screen in front of you and getting excited about how far you're going to go that day. And, you know, that's human nature for anyone who, who loves their numbers and, and, and is into performance. But there's other moments where you are not in the race, you're lost in the world around you, that sort of slideshow view of the world, the landscape, the people, the, the cultures. is incredibly addictive when you join places up at the speed of a bike. And there's other times when you're, you're thinking of none of those things, neither the race nor the... You're simply, you know, a robot on the bike and you're thinking about your family. You're thinking about the future, the past. You're digging out memories you thought you'd long forgotten. I mean, people often say to me, don't you get lonely and bored on the bike? That's the assumption when you spend so much time in your own head. Um, you know, I'm not an introverted person. I don't ride my bike because I'm escaping any reality or needing that space. You know, it's a cliche, but you can be lonely and bored in the London underground. But I've never been 
riding across these great expanses across the planet and feeling sorry for myself and lonely and bored. Well, I might feel sorry for myself, but uh, it, it's, you know, you have chosen to be there and, and, and that sense of purpose comes through what you're doing. It's just a different reality. It's a different headspace and it's, it's probably the hardest bit to explain when you come back and you're trying to capture all this in an, in an hour. But it's... I spend half my life on expedition wishing I was at home, and I spend half my life at home wishing I was on expedition. <laughs> you know, we're fickle animals, aren't we? So there is something very addictive about that space. I have never found anything else in life that has that incredible, clear sense of purpose and momentum. You know, there's nothing else I do, work, family, which, you know, everything has its place. Everything is about a routine. You know, it might be brutally tough, but, you know... I think, I think the addictive part of, of expeditions, when you've planned them so carefully, is you've taken choice out of the equation. One of the most paralyzing things with the world we live in is we are spoilt by choice. We do very little because we have too, much op too many options. Um, and that's a real discipline, especially for young people as they start their careers. You know, committing to... to and, 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 and cutting the noise, creating that simple sense of purpose. Um, you know, the efficiency that you gain through, through, through being task oriented. You know, people think they're wonderful by multitasking, but not realizing how inefficient that is. You know, when you have a, a simple project, a simple process, and, and you're absolutely at the heart of it, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a clarity and a sense of purpose that you get, which you don't get. So, so that assumption that you get lonely and you get bored because you go, is actually, is actually the opposite because you've got, you've got momentum, you've got clarity, you've got a routine. Um, but I would simply, if that doesn't make sense, encourage you to go on a, on a journey. You, know, you can walk it, you can, you can cycle it, do whatever you wish. But, but create an A to B. Create a journey where you've got a simple routine to go through. You know, declutter and, and, you know, <coughs> and live that. And it's, it's incredible. And build momentum into it. People always say to me, don't you think you're spoiling these great trips by going so fast? M momentum, momentum intensifies the experience. It, 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 it gives you a greater connectedness with the world around you. You know, you need the kindness of strangers. Okay, you're not stopping and sitting around the campfire every night and, 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 and reflecting in a normal way. But, but that intensity you know, becomes your fondest memories. And I don't know if any of that made sense, but it's, it's, something, I, I, it's something I have tried to write about, but it's probably at the, at the heart of why I would never be a racer. I mean, I, 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 I've never been inspired. We're all wired up differently to race the man on my shoulder. I love the idea of going out there and doing stuff that's not been done before or first or fastest and the, the psychology of pushing yourself through these, these, these challenges. But as I say, we're... we're we're all motivated by different things, and, and my journey definitely was from that 12-year-old kid through to what I've done. So there's two decades plus. So, so what I do doesn't seem quite so crazy. I think it's when you're, you know, anyone who's been suitably ambitious in their career for 20 years, it might be quite hard to imagine the mindset that they find quite normal. <laughs> so there was loads of other hands, and I'm sure there's other questions, um, and uh, I would definitely welcome you to come and grab a drink and, and come have a chat afterwards. So... Thank you to Leslie and the team from Napier for their support over the years. Great fun to come back and uh, be a part of the, the Chancellor's series. Thank, thank you, David, for the invitation. And thank you for coming. Well, my role um, is to give a vote of thanks. And very often when you're in this uh, position, you kind of do a brief uh, summary of what has been said or your takeaways, and that would just seem so inappropriate. Uh, so what I just want to say is some of the things that have stuck with me. I have found that one of the most um, intense experiences. It was almost as if I was hoping he'd make it, and yet... And yet I knew the end of the story. So it was an incredibly intense experience. Things that stood out for me was uh, the art of the possible, working out that art of the possible, that clear goal and setting you the goal, not breaking a record, 
It was about what is the art of the possible and committing to do that. I was very struck by, we all know Mark uh, uh, Beaumont as that individual, incredible, inspiring, but what came through was so much the team, for me, was the team around him and the importance of that. Uh, and that, that, that was really. And when I go home to my children tonight, I shall tell them what stuck with me, that riding 18,000 miles in 276 days is very, very slow. <laughs> so on that note, um, David told you at the start of this that uh, this was about bringing in inspiring people with a story to tell and connecting those people with our communities here in Edinburgh. I hope it's delivered that for you tonight. Thank you so much, Mark, for being here, for doing our Chancellor's talk. What I want to say now is a piece of housekeeping. Mark is going to, delighted to take questions, but if you could just sit still till he gets out the door, because I know it's going to be mobbed. I also know he didn't mention, but I want to say that his book is outside, and I'm sure he would be happy to sign it. I'm offering you I'm offering that on your behalf, Mark. So if you could just wait two minutes, there are drinks and canopies outside uh, while Mark and Leslie uh, go out then. Be delighted to, to, to carry on our conversations outside. Thank you very much again for being here. <laughs>